Hey everybody, welcome to the Morning Devo with Boo. 9.09 a.m. and it is, what's the date? April 8th. So April 8th, and I was looking up this um, today, I was just kind of checking it out, but you can go to uh, timeanddate.com and it gives you the total solar eclipse that's going to happen today kind of the path and a map and the times kind of where it's and it looks like it's coming into kind of mexico really and then it coming up into texas um and then kind of wrapping up gonna hit maine um but anyway you could kind of check that out and i wonder if it'll show kind of what it's gonna look like for us you know because uh it's kind of little bit of ways from us but um i wonder what that means i wonder what it means but anyway i'm glad to be back in the house of devo today um let's see i was out let's see wednesday thursday friday so i wasn't with you kind of the last part of last week and that's because I was out in Tahoe skiing, visiting uh, my second dad out there. Uh, shout out to John and Judy. That was awesome hanging out with them. And uh, on the second day, I happened to, my ski actually went out from under me, uh, which is not what you want to do when you ski the slopes that I ski on. So uh, we try to tune our skis actually to where um, they don't come off. That's kind of how we want to tune those skis Um, because if they come off and you're going fast, man, you are going to, you know, that's not what you want. You you want those things to stay on even when it's a lot of turbulence and you're in a lot of speed. Um, What's up, Paula? Glad that uh, uh, I'm back with you guys. So, um, yeah. Um, But I am broken a little bit. You know, I must say I did bust all in here. So right now, all in this area is super, super sore. I can't laugh. Um, I can't cough well. Um, But um, um, I definitely can breathe good. So praise the Lord for that. So my doctor out there, Paula, you're, hey, you're, you're, you're my doctor, Laura. I don't know if she's going to be in today, but, but yeah, um, Uh, I certainly broke something in there, but um, I can breathe in, breathe in pretty deep too, which is awesome. Um, You know, it does have a a little bit of a stiffness, you know, to it and a little bit of a oomph. You did something in there, Um, but uh, grateful that uh, nothing more than that Um, and grateful that my knees are intact. But anyway, my, my equipment just broke. Um, which is really weird. Just something happened, and it it, it just flew off. Um, so um, yeah, skiing on one ski on steep slopes, uh, especially in Tahoe, is not what you want to do. Anyway, we're going to be in Isaiah eight. If you don't know me, my name's Bo, and I am one of the ministers at Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, a Calvary Chapel Church, with Senior Pastor Scott Richards. And uh, I'll be teaching this Wednesday for Scott um, as he gets out of town. And I want to also do a little bit of a... um just pay my respects to the Lusco family. Um, Chip Lusco passed away recently, and um, um, we uh, were involved in ministry with Chip years ago, and uh, I did some ministry with his son, Levi Lusco, um, at some outreaches over a period of like three years. So uh, anyway, uh, Chip has served at uh, Calvary Chapel Albuquerque for a long, long time, and uh, uh, you know, just a big, uh, big hug to to that family, um, and uh, I know they're mourning the loss of, of uh, their loved one. But uh, right now, we're going to get into Isaiah chapter eight, and here we go. Let's read it. It says, "Then the Lord said to me, and this is member right after this sign that's supposed to be given to the king." saying, hey, um, you know, and the sign was kind of had to do with uh, a war that was going to take place, you know, that there was going to be a sign given by God that when this happens, you know, you're going to be taken captive by this empire. It's kind of a scary thing when maybe we want to hear from God and 
God does speak and we really don't want to listen. And maybe that's why most people, so many people reject the Bible. It's because we just, we continually are in that mode of just not really wanting what God has to say. Hey, this morning, maybe it's good for us to, you know, just kind of settle our heart that, hey, you know what, let me, let me agree with God and maybe let me get rid of my own stuff, you know? So, hey, let's do that. Let's get rid of our own stuff and let's start agreeing with God on stuff. So it says, the Lord said to me, make a large signboard and clearly write this name on it. Mahar Shalal Hash Baz. Wow. I asked Uriah the priest and Zechariah, son of Jerechiah, uh, uh, both known as honest men, to witness me doing this. What a name, right? Write the name. Uh, Mahar Shalal Haz Baz. Then I slept with my, my, with my wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Hmm, interesting. And it says, And the Lord said, Call him Mahar Shalal Hajbaz. For before this child is old enough to say, Papa or Mama, the king of Assyria will carry away both the abundance of Damascus and the riches of Samaria. Then the Lord spoke to me again and said, My care for the people of Judah is like the gently flowing waters of Shiloh, but they have rejected it. They are rejoicing over what will happen to King Rezin and King Pekah. Therefore, the Lord will overwhelm them with a mighty flood from the Euphrates River. The king of Assyria and all his glory, this flood will overflow all its channels and sweep into Judah until it is chin deep. It will spread its wings, submerging your land from one end to the other, O Emmanuel. Okay, so this is the idea. This is kind of the near fulfillment of what we read in chapter 7. So I did mention a little bit of that technical idea when it comes to biblical prophecy, that you'll see a near fulfillment and then a far fulfillment too. Of course, Jesus being that far fulfillment of this chapter 7 and chapter 8, Emmanuel, God with us, the child with us. And so here, though, we see that Isaiah, it's Isaiah's child that will be a sign to the king. And when that child's a little older, that'll be the time where Assyria will come in. And notice it says that the people have rejected the flowing waters of Shiloh. Something beautiful, the rest that they could get from God, they've rejected it. You know, how many of us as human beings have rejected, you know, salvation? How many of us have said no over and over and over, right? Though, And it's interesting. You know, Jesus offers salvation freely. It's not like you got to pay for it. It's not like you got to give something. In a sense, what you give is your ambition. You give your idolatry of yourself you know you lay that down and then you say god you know you're on the throne of my life and it's in that in that way we are uh moving away from us and we're putting god in it you know god's rightful place you know if god's god then and there is a god then it would only beg to kind of you know be that God would have to be primary, um, that God's ways or God's word would be primary over me, the creation. And it's interesting that maybe the reason why we don't have any rest out there in the world is because none of us are looking for God. And this is what the Bible continues to say. There's no one good, no, not one. Like the psalm said, right? All of us have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way, our own devices. And it's interesting just in Isaiah that this has happened to God's chosen people whom the Messiah is supposed to come out of. That's the interesting thing about the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. 
you think, oh, yeah, it's going to be those those crazy Vikings up north that are going to be way off. Or, you know, those people way down south, they're going to be way off. Nope. No, it's actually even God's chosen people need the salvation that is being offered. And it says they rejected it. Oh, those are tough words to read in verse 6, right? So it says, verse 9, Huddle together, you nations, and be terrified. Listen, all you distant lands. Prepare for battle, but you will be crushed. Oh, everybody's going to prepare for battle. It's going to be kind of that way, too, in the future. We'll read some of that, too. But notice it says, prepare for battle. You will be crushed, right? Yes, prepare for battle. Call your counselors of war, but they will be worthless. Develop your strategies, but they will not succeed. For God is with us. Interesting. This baby is a is a sign. <laughs> this God with us in Isaiah's day is a sign that God's judgment is firm. And that no counsel's going to stop what God or thwart God's plan. Now, this idea of seeking counsel is going to be seen again and again in the book of Isaiah. Seeking counselors for war, going to other people and listening to them, receiving this kind of counsel, right, from others. And that's interesting because, man, this morning, it's good for us to just settle in our heart, maybe to get counsel from the Lord, right? And that's why we're in the devotion time, right? That's why we do devotions is because why? We want to get counsel from God. You know, if Israel had rejected God, right, said, I don't want counsel from God. And God said, well, okay. I mean, even as my covenant nation, you know, that is, we're like married together, you know, the whole Exodus thing, right? The whole contract and the law of God and 10 commandments, we enter into that. But if you want to reject it, well, then you, okay, but there's consequences. It's like in a marriage, man, right? If someone rejects the covenant, I mean, how many people on the planet have been in a marriage where the covenant was rejected by a person? Man, it, it's difficult, right? And there is a parting of the ways. Even it can go on for a long time. You could still be in covenant with that person, meaning he's still in the marriage, but things are really rough, right? There is so much judgment taking place, separation, discontentment, um, division, you know, uh, everything's crumbling in a sense. And that's what you see here. Don't seek counsel from others. Wow, that's a good thing for me to think of, Bo. <laughs> I'm talking to myself. You know, receive counsel from the Lord. Let's go to the Lord first. God, you know, what would you have me do? Before I call my friend and seek counsel, nothing's wrong with counsel from friend, remember? There's a good thing. Mul uh, multitude of counselors is a good thing. But not at the expense of going to the primary, and that's God. For the Lord has given me a strong warning to think like everyone else does. He said, this is interesting. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think, sorry, not to think like everyone else does. Man, do I think like everybody else does? That's a great question too this morning. Don't call everything conspiracy like they do, and don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of Heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one you should, who should make you tremble. He will keep you safe. But to Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare." Interesting, right? It says, don't call everything conspiracy like they do, and don't live in dread of what frightens them. Interesting. People that are constantly calling things conspiracy, constantly, you know, it sounds like they're being influenced by a lot of news, you know, in Isaiah's day. I wonder if that sounds familiar to any of you, right? Influenced by a ton of information. That's just not true. See, God raises prophets, okay, to clearly communicate 
really what God is wanting to get across. Meaning, amongst the chaos in Israel, amongst all the news networks in Israel's day, all the different ones, ABC, CBC of Isaiah's day, the prophets are raised up by God to say they're wrong. Isn't that interesting? The, the prophets come on the scene primarily to debunk what everybody is saying, what they're calling conspiracy, what they're living in dread of. And it says they're totally moving everybody's eyes off of the Lord. What a trip. How people in power in Isaiah's day had news networks as well, had propaganda machines, moved the world through news, moved the, net, moved the nation through news, and God raised up a people to be able to communicate really what's going on. Isn't that what the church is there for? And praise God for that church, right? That actually is teaching the revelation of God. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, even as a pagan, you know, progressive growing up dude in SoCal, did I want to go to a church that was teaching what I already believed? Like some watered down version of the Bible? Like, I didn't want to do, I didn't want that. I could get that just going to the clubs and the concerts. I could get a a quasi, you know, r- religion, a pseudo thing going, some new agey thing. I mean, that's everywhere in Southern California, in Northern California. That kind of idea is all over the place. When I wanted to come to the church, man, I wanted to hear something different. I was hoping for some true revelation. Has someone really heard about God? Yeah. This is what the prophets are doing. They're saying, thus saith the Lord, make heaven's armies, right? It says the Lord of heaven's armies, holy in your life. He is the one you should fear, right? He is the one you should look at, right? He will keep you safe. But to Judah and Israel, it will be a stone that you stumble over, a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many will stumble and fall, never to rise again. They will be snared and captured. Man, God to them is just going to be the judge. That's what God will be. And for many people, unfortunately, God's just going to be their judge. You know, they haven't trusted him to put him in the place, God in the place of being their savior. Instead, they've just held on to their like I got it all together and all God can do with that all God can do with sin is judge it and so he he will be your judge so man do I make the heaven of lord the lord's armies who's holy do I make him holy in my life you know how do I honor God in my life Many will stumble and fall. It says in verse 16, preserve the teachings of God and trust his instruction to those who follow me. See, that's what Isaiah is called to do. Preserve the teaching of God and trust the instruction to those who follow me. What a blessing it is, right? When we in our lives preserve the word of God in our families, we're the ones who are the beacons of the revelation of God. God uses you. God uses me like he used Isaiah. Man, what a trip, right? That God would do that. And that we get to entrust his teachings with other people. Give them to them. That they may do that as well. I will wait for the Lord who has turned away from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my hope in him. That's right. The, the, The prophet says, I'm going to trust the Lord no matter what. Even though what has God done? He has turned away. There has been a separation. You know, just as Adam and Eve, there was a divorce in the garden, right? Remember we saw that? There was a separation. So now we see that there's a separation with Israel 
right, with, or with Judah and Jerusalem, specifically in this section, with Yahweh. And Isaiah says, but I'm going to put my hope in him. And Isaiah goes on to be that news network, the rightful news network. Paula says, I don't even watch the news anymore. I get my news from a reason for hope. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Hey, Patty. Hey, Mike. Hope you guys are well. Uh, let me see if anybody's on YouTube as well. Um, I thought maybe Talon would be there, but nope. Um, then it says, I and the children of the Lord that the Lord has given me serve as signs and warnings to Israel from the Lord of heaven's armies who dwell in his temple on Mount Zion. So there it is, the little summary, right? That child, that Emmanuel, that's God with us. Um, we're having a baby. God's with us. That baby in Isaiah's day was going to be the proof and the, if you will, the countdown clock to judgment. The Assyrian army will come in. Someone may say to you, let's ask the mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead with their whispering and mutterings. They will tell us what to do. Go to those fortune tellers. Go to this person. Go to that person. Let's go to this. Let's go to that. Let's go to other sources, but let's not go to the Lord. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Shouldn't the living, should the living seek guidance from the dead? Hmm? I think Jesus quoted that passage, right? Maybe Jesus had that same idea in mind. You know, shouldn't we seek the Lord? Look to God's instruction and teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the dark. They will go from one place to another, weary and hungry. And because they are hungry, they will rage and curse their king and their God. They will look up to heaven and down to the earth. And whatever they look, they will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. They will be thrown out into the darkness. Mm. Again, judgment, right? One place to another. All over the place. Searching, searching, never finding. Not so much like our lives. Always searching, never finding, right? Everybody's searching for something. Oh, I found this. I found Krishna. I found this. I found that. I Now I have new age philosophy. Now I'm into this. Now I'm into that, right? We go, oh, and so people sometimes use Christianity like that. Oh, now I'm part of a Christian group. And Yahweh says, no, I am the true and living God. And we're going to see just how he is the only true and living God in this book. Isaiah's bringing out that God is not just some other God of gods and some other religion of religions. And, and, that, and you're going to see that this is what the prophets are saying to Israel and in turn the world is that Yahweh is not just some other thing, just some other kind of, oh, it's Israel's God. Have you ever heard a professor say that? Yahweh was Israel's deity and they made up their deity off of the pagans. And no, no, the whole point of the prophets, if you just read the Bible like we are, you understand that when you get to the prophets, you re the prophets are sharing with everybody that Yahweh isn't someone who's made up by Israel, or he's not just an, an equivalent of one of the Canaanite deities. No, he is the true and living God, that, that there is no other, that he is to be sought, and he is holy, and he is just. And if we don't come to him on his terms, in the right way, according to the way his laws work, the way they work, the spiritual laws that are in place, just as there's natural laws, there's spiritual laws. And if we don't come to him in the right way, that, that all we're left with is, is his justice, his righteous justice on human beings. I mean, he is just and he's righteous and he's kind and he's patient and he's loving, but he doesn't get rid of love and because he's just, he doesn't give rid of his compassion because he's righteous, and he certainly doesn't give a, a, get rid of his righteousness because he's loving. No, God encompasses all those attributes perfectly, but he, he acts in those ways. This is what Jesus came to do. God's righteous wrath against sin is seen in Jesus. He judges the Son on your behalf. God's justice is seen in his judgment and, and his receiving of the sacrifice of Jesus, a perfect, a, living a perfect life, 
right? Jesus doesn't let Jesus, or God doesn't, the Father doesn't let Jesus off the hook. No. It says it pleased the Father to crush the Son. It was something that, in a sense, appeased or quenched the righteous wrath of God. But God's also compassionate and loving, and we see that in Jesus too. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So God's attributes are seen in himself and in, in, in his son, Jesus. Um, but we can't, we have to come to him on his terms and, and want his counsel. So I hope you see that, man, God is, is doing amazing things through the prophet Isaiah. He's bringing news and news that's really important, you know, to the nation not just to the nation, but to the world, that you can't just overlook Yahweh. And we certainly don't want to in our life either. Um, you know, so a very cool chapter. It's a fulfill. It's kind of, it rolls right from seven to eight. It's a very important one because it gives us the understanding of really chapter seven. And that, and then we see a future fulfillment of Emmanuel, God with us. Meaning when we look at Jesus, we see that his righteous wrath, his justice, and his love, and his compassion are all there in Emmanuel, God with us. So very cool. Anyway, it's good to be back. Um, I feel like I got some allergies, but... Other than that, my breathing is, hey, somewhat okay with some broken ribs. So it's Broken Rib Monday, I guess, um, during the time of the eclipse. But anyway, you guys take care, and uh, thank you so much for uh, all the prayers and the support. And we will be back at you, uh, let's see, tomorrow, Lord willing. And Talon is in the house on Facebook or on YouTube. So what's up, Talon? Glad you're with me, man. And uh, so you guys maybe reread chapter eight again. Maybe read it with seven. But man, really good things about God in this section for sure. So have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye.